uh, I am Marion Forrester. I am from the Kingdom of the Outlands, the Barony of Kerta, which is the Denver area. I've been in the SCA for about 20 years now, and I've been doing illumination for about 15 and studying pigments and paintbrushes and all things scribal for about four years now. Um, and this is the second time I've done this class, so hopefully I've worked out the kinks by now. Uh, another little fun fact about me, I am currently the Kingdom Arts and Science Champion for the Outlands, and I will be that until we actually can have uh, another event. <laughs> so I am going to share my screen here. Come on. Okay, here we go. And here is my uh, blog in case you want to contact me. I am uh, Lisa C. Adams on Facebook. If you want to friend me, ask any questions, message me, whatever. I am always willing to talk pigments and anything like that. So, disclaimers. I'm focusing on pigments coming into Europe just because that's kind of what I've been studying. Those are the manuscripts I've been reading. No dissing any other pigments around the world. There was trade going both ways and it was awesome. And you will see a lot of the same kind of pigments in other parts of the world. Uh, because we have an hour, I'm not going to go over every pigment or artist material. And also there's only so much time I have for studying this. And this is an ongoing area of study for me. So um, I'm learning a little bit more and more as we go. So how do we know about trade in medieval pigments and artist materials? First of all, we have the names. And sometimes this was because of uh, where the pigment originated. And sometimes this was from where it was being traded from. So one of the uh, pigment names that we have is you'll often see uh, Venice Ceruse or Venice White or Venice Lead White or something like that. And that's because that was mostly being made in Venice. But if you see Baghdad Indigo, um, which you will see Indigo as opposed to um, Woad, and they both use Indigo, it gets confusing, um, but that is where it was being traded from, not necessarily where it originated. Uh, we also have a lot of trade documents like ship manifests, pigment price lists, toll books, and account books. Uh, we had, and let's see, and some of these, like the account book, um, if you look at a record from there, it'll say like, uh, we have um, this, pigment payment uh, payment to a certain person for pigments for a certain project or maybe just a pigment or material and then followed by what they all bought and usually the price too um, and correspondence sometimes they were writing back and forth I'm gonna need this or that um, and wills and inventories this one's kind of interesting because it'll tell us like um, what was left in a shop after somebody died or this person was holding on to these pigments for this project and the benefactor wanted them back. And the last I think is the most interesting and that is the archeological evidence. And the neatest thing is the Nalik shipwreck. Uh, the name of the ship was the Gagliana Grossa, and it sank on its way to Constantinople from Venice in late October or early November 1583 off the island of Nalik in what is now Croatia. And at the time, the ship was carrying a cargo capacity of about 12,000 barrels, and um, mostly in glass and pigments. So if you're into glass, this is another one. Look it up. There's lots of information, lots of photos. 
the pigments on board are mostly still distinguishable. We can tell almost exactly what it was carrying. We can tell lead white and um, we can tell different lake pigments. And a lake pigment, this is a terminology I'm gonna use quite a bit. That's when you have a biological material like a plant or an insect and you're extracting the color from that and through a chemical process, it's binding to some sort of calcium carbonate um, like eggshell or marble dust or um, chalk. Um, there's and a quick question in the chat. Um, oh, uh, Emma asks, what was the name of the ship? Uh, it was the Gagliana Grossa. And I have a handout that I'll either share on the event page or I'll send it to the event stewards and everything, um, but that wasn't quite ready. So I will send that off later. It'll also be on my uh, blog. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the inventory from the ship for its last voyage, but uh, very cool stuff. And we'll see a picture from what was brought up later on. We can still tell what these are and in what form they were uh, contained in when the ship went down. The pigment trade was wide ranging. This wasn't just a within Europe thing. It was all over. Sometimes these pigments were made locally, but they also bought a lot of the same pigment from around pretty much the world. From everywhere from the New World later in period to the Far East, Afghanistan, Africa, everywhere. And pigments were part of a larger coloring trade, not just painting. So these same pigments a lot of times were used in dyeing, uh, both cloth and leather, ceramics, glass, medicine, uh, ultramarine they used as a medicine uh, to treat melancholy. I'm, I'm sure if you spent that much, uh, you'd hope it would work. And in, sometimes they were cooking spices. So who was selling this kind of stuff? And it varied widely from time and place. Uh, what we see most often was that it was being sold by apothecaries, uh, along with spices and um, medicines, because a lot of these were also used as that. Um, We also see traveling merchants and nobles and sometimes even clergy who were carrying these along on their journeys and selling them as they went. Uh, depending on time and place, we had different guilds that were selling them, either merchant guilds or artist or art dealer guilds. And uh, we'll go through a couple of those. Um, In Antwerp, we know that uh, the big guild that was selling them was the Guild of St. Luke, and uh, that was the Guild of Artists and Art Dealers. Um, and oftentimes these were part of a merchant guild or, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Antwerp. It was a big seller of uh, pigments and art materials, a big artist community. The people who were selling these were specialized later in period uh, from like the 1400s on. And I'm not even going to try and uh, pronounce some of these, uh, but paint sellers and merchants of colors and art dealers. And the art dealers weren't just selling art, they were also selling uh, pigments along with paintings. Uh, and uh, major cities that were doing this, a big one was Antwerp again, and they were trading with France, Spain, Germany, and England a lot of times. They had a special market area that was reserved for artists, and these were called pond, or the plural of this was ponden. The first market of this kind was in 1460, and it was Our Lady's Pond. In 1540, we had one that specialized just in painting, and that was the Schilders Pond. And that one had over 100 stalls of people selling art and artist materials. 
Another one was Florence, and this was a huge uh, fabric town. And a lot of the pigments that were used in dyeing fabric were also used in painting. So that was, um, that makes a lot of sense. And finally, Venice was huge. They had countries, a lot of um, countries that were trading by uh, sea and such as like the Byzantine Empire, uh, a lot of Eastern countries were sending stuff through Venice. A lot of times they would come in as a raw material and then be refined in Venice before selling them on. Sometimes you would have fairs in towns and sometimes these were like an annual or biannual fair lasting months or more. And we have some of the price lists from those. We have a price list from a fair in Germany for several years. And um, so those prices were regulated. In what form were pigments sold? And this is the really cool part. The picture on the side is uh, from that shipwreck. So they were either sold in a raw, ma in a raw material or more refined and sometimes by weight. Sometimes they were sold in quantities of what they were held in, like a sack load, barrel, or box. And especially later on, sometimes they would be sold as cloth shearings. And this was just little, be little pieces of cloth that were cut off. Um, and uh, you would extract the pigments from the dyed fabric. And uh, sometimes they were shaped into lumps or balls. And that's what we see over to the side. Those are kind of a truncated cone uh, piece of white lead. And uh, that is from the Nalik shipwreck. And uh, if you're going searching for it, I, I, um, you're probably gonna find it through uh, the name of where the ship sank. And, um, some t they also found little balls, little uh, lake pigment balls of Brazil wood, cochineal, lac, it seems, or matter. It seems to all be the red colors, which is kind of interesting. Sometimes there were different grades of a pigment. We find fine azure or uh, fine, fine gold or something like that, as opposed to just regular, which would have a much lower cost. What pigments were in use? Uh, here we have a pretty good uh, list, but there were a lot more. A lot of minerals and a lot of lake pigments. And these would differ from time to time, place to place. And we'll go through these and uh, talk a bit more about them. Other artist materials. Uh, today we'll be talking about alum, gum arabic, and gum mastic. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of information on some of the rest of these, but I have found information that they were traded. So let's start in on some of the pigments that they uh, used. A huge one was lead white. And uh, this was not only just as a pigment, but it was also used in uh, making gesso and lake pigments. Uh, you could bind your uh, botanical material or insect pigment to the uh, lead white. Uh, and there's different names for it. You're going to find it all over. So a little bit of terminology. We have flake lead white and ceruse. And flake lead white was just you would suspend a piece of lead over something like um, vinegar or sometimes urine or wine, some sort of acid, and leave it there. And then you would scrape off the white flakes and use that as your pigment. Or if you wanted something finer, you would make ceruse. And that was, you would grind it in water and wash it several times. A lot of times after you would let it sit in the water for several days and then you'd form it into the, into the uh, conical shapes that you saw earlier. And we actually have some uh, evidence of the forms that they were using. Uh, there was 
an inventory of someone who died and had a lead white pigment processing facility and uh, they had um, the forms in their possession when they died. Uh, one of the, uh, to tell you how amazing that the lead white was, um, the ceruse was, how much better it was. It was described by a writer in period as the color of fresh milk in the spring that still has the foam on its surface. Sounds very poetic. And you could get differences in uh, the degree of your material by differences in the heat when you were making it, the strength of your vinegar, the shape of the pots, and your ventilation. So all sorts of different things. Uh, it was mainly made, mainly made in Italy, and Venice was very famous for this. This was the best stuff. It was, and Venice started exporting it in the 14th century. Ceruse being more refined could be twice the, play, uh, twice the price of lead white. Um, just to let you know, there's a question that's come in. Um, Alakina Philia Elfin asks, um, I've heard somewhere that lakes were sometimes soaked into fabric scraps and dried for transport. Uh, yes. Then the pigment would be unsoaked and added to the calcium. Is this something you found? Um, with uh, cochineal especially, uh, that's what you would find, especially later in period. Uh, earlier on, it seems like they would make it into a lake right away and then ship it. But uh, later on, it seems that they were um, extracting it from the fabric and uh, making it into the pigment. Okay, other lead pigments. White is not the only color you can get from it. If you heat the pigment, you can get either yellow or red. Um, and uh, again, same sources as lead white. We do have one mention of where lead yellow was coming from. And this is from one of the fair lists. And this is the Leaknitz Taxa of 1614. And we have earlier versions of these, the fair documents from this area. But this one mentions that they were getting lead yellow from England and Lubeck in Northern Germany. Uh, lead was also combined with tin and you'll see tin being traded on its own as well. It is a later used pigment, mostly coming in in the 14th century and later. And it was also used as a glass coloring agent. And therefore it's not surprising that it was often coming from Venice, but also from Flanders and Bohemia. And again, uh, you're going to see some of the um, names of places in with the pigment, but in this, in this um, uh, time, it's where the merchant was coming from, not where it was manufactured. And orpiment. This was mostly used earlier in history, and it seems to have been mined mostly in Austria and Saxony. There seemed to have been a lot of mining going on in Saxony, but large amounts were also coming from the Far East in Kurdistan and Syria and China. Earth pigments, we have a lot of them. Um, and lots of different colors. And they were found all over, but some places had really good colors and they would be uh, named for where they were from, like Siena, Verona Green Earth, or uh, Pavazano de Flandres. You can change the color of an earth pigment by roasting it or heating it, and that's where we get like burnt umber from or burnt sienna. Another of the earth pigments that was used a lot was bull, and Armenian bull was the most prized out of this, and you'll see this a lot in gesso recipes. It gives the reddish color underneath the gold. Uh, green earth was mostly from Tuscany or the Ven Veneto, and uh, you'll see like, um, Verona green earth a lot.
cinnabar and vermilion. These are the same chemical, but cinnabar is the naturally occurring mineral and vermilion is manufactured using sulfur and um, mercury. So this is not something you want to play with at home. Uh, when they were getting the uh, mineral itself, it was often mined in Almaden, Spain, beginning in Roman times. Later, it was being imported in, in small quantities from Mexico and Peru from the New World. And mostly it was being traded by the Crown of Aragon and Italy and later Castile. Vermilion, this is the manufactured one again. It was more commonly used, which is a little bit surprising because it's so nasty. Um, could be uh, created anywhere, but Spain was the most important producer and the quality of this was considered to be the best of any. Uh, our Antwerp actually had the best stuff and uh, there was a writer in period who said, a man in Antwerp makes vermilion three times more red than the ordinary. And Antwerp itself, uh, in one shipment, sent 400 pounds of vermilion from Antwerp to Cologne. So this was just one shipment. That is a lot of pigment. Okay, uh, smolt. Uh, this is uh, from a cobalt uh, coloring and this was um, mined and then processed into almost like a glass. It was uh, heated and mixed with stones and um, sand and potash and then melted and fused. And when you put it into water, then it would fracture and you could grind it easier. It was cheaper than ultramarine, but it was not used in oil paintings because it would become very transparent. Um, it was more popular later in period and the refined smalt was much better and worth four times as much. The production of this began mostly in Saxony around 1470 and it was produced in Italy, especially Murano and Venice. And considering these are glass uh, creating areas, this is not surprising. So uh, this is another thing that was uh, multi-use. We have some production from the Rhineland and Saxony, again, because it was being, the ore was being mined and it was being distributed by Flanders merchants who seemed to be doing a lot of pigment uh, trade. One producer, Master Bernard, was mentioned um, as being the favorite of the Spanish. Ultramarine and lapis lazuli. These are, um, ultramarine is the refined form of lapis lazuli uh, once it's been grown or once it's been ground. Uh, and we're going to see one of the things that you use to make ultramarine later on. The lapis lazuli would be combined with gum mastic and beeswax and uh, something else uh, to get all of the um, calcite, which doesn't have any color out of it and make a much brighter pigment. Almost all of the ultramarine came from the same mine in Afghanistan and then was shipped through Constantinople or, Constantinople or Persia and then on to Venice. And then Venice would distribute it uh, around Europe. Um, so you've got about half an hour um, and a, a question's come in from Rosalind Beaufort asking, have you found much on the health impacts of manufacturing these pigments? Uh, we do have some evidence that this was not good for you. I believe it is uh, Chinini who said something about um, the impact on those who manufacture it and he suggests buying it from someone who's already made it as opposed to making it yourself because it was hazardous. So they did know how bad it was. Azurite and malachite, uh, they're blue and green, but they are very close chemically. Uh, they are both a uh, copper carbonate hydroxide. Uh, so, and azurite was used quite a bit, a lot more than 
you would probably think. Um, but sometimes it would turn greenish over time and turn more into the malachite. And when you would mine this stuff, uh, sometimes it's hard to separate it out because they like to exist together. Um, and there's a lot of confusion when you read different recipes and different trade documents and you see azure. That could be ultramarine or that could be azurite. If it says something like mountain azure, it's most likely azurite instead of ultramarine. Or a very fine azure may be ultramarine. If you see an astronomical price, it's probably ultramarine and not azurite. But there seems to have been some really high quality azurite out there as well. Um, since this was a mined uh, mineral, it's not surprising that it came mostly from Germany. Um, who seem to be doing a whole lot of mining. And some, we have uh, examples of some smaller local sources like Castile, Hungary, and Armenia. And later on, some was uh, imported from the Dominican Republic uh, in the New World. Verdigris. Uh, this one is a manufactured one. If you've never made it before, it's really easy. You take a copper sheet and just like with the lead, you suspend it over something like vinegar or uh, maybe wine. Uh, there was a small amount of local production, but you will see a whole lot of recipes for um, verdigris in many, many pig uh, pigment manuscripts. It was also, um, from the location of the recipe, you could find an, a different name, either Spanish green or vert de Gris, and this is where we get verdigris from. Uh, Montpelier, France was a major production center. Hungary and Germany also did, and it was traded mostly by Italy and Flanders. Kermes and cochineal, these two are very close. Uh, they're little insects that you crush up and extract the pigment from. Kermes was uh, new, was old world, and cochineal was mostly new world, but I believe there is one species that was somewhere in Eastern Europe. Um, if you see, and they were both called grana, which makes it very confusing. Uh, Grana cochineala was uh, mostly Kermes, which is again kind of confusing. And uh, Grana de Indias, which uh, you think of the West Indies and that brings you to the New World. Or Cochineala de no Nopal, which refers to the cactus that it was grown on. Kermes is uh, grown around the roots of an oak tree and it's a mostly Mediterranean insect. Um, a, most of it coming from Valencia, Spain. Also from a little bit from Poland and later Italy. Cochineal, this was a huge, huge, huge um, import later on in, um, in period. And I'll go through a little bit about that again. We find it sometimes in lake balls and sometimes from fabric clippings. And it has a much larger output than Kermes. So when they started producing this, uh, when they started going to the new world, it was a great thing because they could get so much out of one insect as opposed to, I think it was something like four times more pigment from cochineal as opposed to Kermes. Oaxaca, Mexico was a huge producer of cochineal. It was being shipped mostly to Seville, Spain, and then it was just being distributed throughout Europe, um, mostly through Antwerp, Rouen, and, um, and then on. Uh, in Mexico, they were averaging between 200 and 900 tons over a 10 year period uh, from the cochineal. Matter root. And this is a plant that was growing all over, uh, but 
there were a few places that were kind of known for it. And one of the first mentions we have is from Pliny the Elder, uh, speaking about it being cultivated in Rome. Uh, Charlemagne in the Capitulare de Villis was uh, quite taken with matter and said that every large manor sh uh, should be growing it um, and producing pigment from it. Uh, Flanders and Romania were big uh, producers of this pigment. Brazil wood, this is a big pigment that you see all over. There were several species that were being harvested either from the old world or the new world and um, being shipped. The chemical comes from the heartwood of the tree and then it oxidizes. Uh, the chemical is Brazilian, which oxidizes into Brazilian. The Portuguese were one of the main importers from Brazil, and the country of Brazil is named after the pigment, not the pigment, or after the country, because they had access to this pigment before they came to Brazil, and then they found a similar species in Brazil. And they first referred to Brazil as Terra de Brazil, or the land of Brazil, uh, referring to the trees. The Spanish were importing Brazil wood mostly from the Honduras, from Cuba, and around the Caribbean. Lac is an insect resin, and this was um, mostly made into a lake pigment. You have, and it was coming all the way from India. Italy was a big trader along as, uh, along with the Portuguese um, and Flanders. And this is, um, I believe this was also used as a fabric pigment. We have some evidence that it was coming through Florence, Italy. It wasn't being produced there necessarily. And it was contained in a list of spices. And some of the interesting other pigments that were listed in this, um, um, with the spices coming in, were ultramarine German blue, which we can assume is azurite because they say German. And uh, one of the, uh, uh, a couple of the other more interesting ones are burnt ivory, which was interesting because they took the time to burn the ivory before they imported it. And this is a carbon black pigment that we'll talk about a little bit later. And mummy, which I'm assuming is being made into mummy brown, uh, which is, a very interesting pigment. Indigo and woad, these are the same chemical in two different plants and um, they are both <laughs> referred to in period a lot of times as indigo. Um, sometimes you'll talk, they'll talk about a uh, flory of indigo and that's probably woad as opposed to indigo. Indigo was coming from farther east, usually through Baghdad, uh, which is why it is often referred to as Baghdad indigo, not because it was grown there, but that's where uh, they were picking it up and sending it on to probably Venice. Uh, in the New World, they started growing this in Guatemala and El, Salvador, El Salvador, and it was being uh, exported by Italy, Spain, and later Portugal. And the import of this became so prevalent that England started protecting against the import of indigo because England was a big producer of woad. Um, although woad was uh, grown all over Europe, uh, England was a huge producer and they wanted to uh, protect their market. Uh, Oh, going back to Spain or to uh, indigo just for a minute. In 1576, Spain imported 11,000 pounds of indigo. And by 20 years later, it rose to 116 pounds. So we see almost a tenfold increase in about 20 years. Carbon black. This is one of my favorite pigments. 
because it's very easy to make. And being so easy to make, you would expect it not to be traded very often. And we don't have a whole lot of um, records of it being um, traded. But we do have the burnt in ivory coming through Florence. And we also have a record of 102 sack loads of carbon for use in Burgundian art. And I thought that was pretty fantastic because it was so much. And I'm kind of wondering if that wasn't being used in black books of ours at that point. Um, most black books of ours, it seems, were tinted with um, iron gall ink, but um, the better preserved ones seem to have been uh, tinted with carbon black instead of iron gall ink. And now we're going to switch to some of the artist materials. And alum is a fascinating one. If you want to get into crazy trade, look this one up. It, there's all sorts of monopolies. And of course, you have the Medici coming in there. It was used in both making pigments and inks and uh, dyeing fabric. It comes from a mineral that um, originally mostly came through Byzantium. But with the fall of the constant, uh, the fall of the Byzantine Empire, you had it, you had people struggling to find somewhere else to get it. And this was, um, they found a few small areas and then they found this mine in Tolfa, Italy in 1462. And this was great. They had high quality alum and uh, the Pope got in on this. And he had control of the mine, and um, that brought a lot of income uh, for the Pope. And this is where the Medici's come in. They started uh, paying the Pope to distribute this around the empire um, in uh, Flanders and England and France and Venice. And uh, again, because this was something used for dyeing fabric, Flanders is not um, a big surprise here because that was a big fabric producing area. Prices got so high in England and Flanders that they started sneaking it in from Turkey. And this brought the threat of excommunication and it gets really juicy here. And Flanders reached a treaty with Rome, but England refused. And it wasn't until the early 16th century that they got a trade agreement and uh, started trading with Rome again. They uh, were sneaking it in through Turkey um, until then. And uh, when they did get that treaty, it was under the agreement that it would be under the lesser prices that they were getting from Turkey. Gum Arabic. This is the sticky stuff that you can use in paints, you can use it in gesso, and it was all over if you were uh, an artist at the time. Um, so this comes from acacia trees, and there were several species of this tree. Mostly these come from the semi-arid regions of Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, and there was a lot of Portuguese trade coming through an island in Africa. Um, and, uh, and then later on, the Spanish took uh, control of this island. And unfortunately, uh, as along with the gum Arabic trade, it was also a slave trade for the Portuguese. And last, we have gum mastic, which is used when you make um, ultramarine. It's one of the um, sticky things. It, you combine it with beeswax and pine resin and take out all the calcite. And this is from a tree that is very close to the edible pistachio. And mostly we were getting this just from one tiny little island. The Greek and Phoenician word, um, uh, the gum mastic comes from the Greek and Phoenician word mastichan or to chew. And this was used as a chewing gum. 
it was not always looked on favorably, but it was used um, a lot as chewing gum in the Middle East, also as an aromatic or um, incense and for medicines for the stomach, cosmetics and candle making. And we have evidence of uh, it being used in candle making in the Byzantine Empire. It was sold, we know, in, uh, at least sometimes in wooden boxes called kufini, and we have some um, idea of how much it was worth, and it was very expensive. According to somebody losing several boxes of these um, being confiscated by the Byzantine Empire, and they were paid back for this. And the island that it was mostly from was Chios, Greece, and that produced the nice white mastic that we see in the picture. Uh, black mastic from Egypt was less prized. Most of this was being sent east to Alexandria and Damascus and that kind of area for culinary or medical uh, use, not for pigments or for um, the making of pigments. 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, if you can see the tiny little island right by Turkey, that's the one island that was uh, producing these trees. Um, and these trees were kind of all over, but they didn't seem to provide as nice of mastic as elsewhere. And it doesn't seem like anyone else took the time to make it. Uh, first of all, the Romans were trading um, gum mastic through here. They had annual trips through um, as a part of, um, let me find here, um, to supply their armies, they would go through the island at least once a year. And that seemed to uh, coordinate with the mastic production. Um, they were also trading wine that was produced from this island. It was under Byzantine rule until the Fourth Crusade, which isn't surprising since it's so close to Turkey. And then the Genoese took uh, control, and it was mostly the Zakaria family for a while, and then a company called the Mahonia Company. And then it slipped back into the Ottoman um, control. While it was being controlled by the Genoese, they made huge improvements to the production. They fortified the towns and uh, kind of streamlined the production and the prices. Um, and only the south half of the island produces uh, the good gum mastic. And that is known as the mastic choria and, and uh, because it is um, so important there. And what they do to collect this is they will score the trees and let the resin drop uh, during the heat of the day. Underneath the trees they have all sorts of calcium carbonate which is chalk and the resin drips down into this and at night it hardens and they collect that out of the calcium carbonate, put down a nice fresh layer of chalk and then during the winter months, they can clean and uh, process the gum mastic to be shipped the next year. And these are my sources. There's several of them. I will make sure that my uh, outline and everything is posted so that if you're interested, you can check these out. And we're on to questions. There are comments in the chat bar, um, which were, you know, being added in as you spoke. Uh, but I think we've actually covered all the questions. Right on. Um, you, but I am sure people have questions. One yeah. question I've got is with the the ivory for ivory black. Um, how much do you know from sort of modern tests if there any have been done? Do we know how black that is or whether it was largely a prestige thing? 
Um, it's more of a browner black. Uh, mm. I've, I've made it and mine turns out more browner, probably from uh, more impurities as opposed to a lot of the other sources. Right. Um, it doesn't seem to be as used as a lot of the other blacks, like mm. bone black was uh, very prized uh, later on. Um, and just like soot from lamp black was used uh, quite a bit. So possibly they were going for more of a brown than a black with that one. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, there, there is a question that might be sneaking off down the bottom of your chat window, um, which was from Hillary asking, what have you tried making successes and failures? Oh my goodness. I have made a lot. I've made uh, azurite, malachite, uh, Brazil wood, lac, um, almost all of the ones that were in my presentation, um, except like um, vermilion, not going to mess with that one. Uh, I haven't made lead white. I've got small children <laughs> and cats, um, but a friend of mine has been making that and uh, keeping me updated on that. Uh, the one I have not gotten to turn out yet is Woad. And that one's kind of an interesting one because this is the scum that forms on the top of a dye vat. It's not the actual uh, stuff that you would die with it's the scum on top and that's why you'll see scum or flory or something like that when they're referring to woad as opposed to indigo um, and uh, I have not gotten that one to work out yet but uh, we'll try that out and uh, so you could scoop off the scum and then dye your fabric after you uh, got the uh, woad scum scraped off that brings up a thought so is, is, would there be a direct link between um, things like the wool production in England and and them selling woad as a byproduct yeah exactly mm. exactly yeah you'll see a lot of connections between uh, these cities were importing it or creating it to use both in fabric and in artist materials and then selling the artist materials as well This isn't a question, more of a, a comment. Um, I went to Scandinavia, Sweden, Norway, and so on last year and had a, spent a lot of time looking at the panel paintings that they have up there and got some fabulous, bought on super special, a fabulous book all about medieval panel paintings. One oh, no. volume, a, a three volume set, one volume of which was totally about the pigments and oh, all wow. of the artist materials. And one of the things that was fascinating in that was that they were using the analysis of the different layers of the materials and being able to identify the specific locations that they came from and were mm -hmm. able to generate trade route maps and to show how the trade in pigments and artist materials changed over time. So you mentioned several examples of this where the, the politics of the time meant that suddenly you couldn't get the resource from that place anymore and you had to find a new supplier or yep. a new resource came online. And um, it, it provides a fascinating insight into how incredibly extensive the trading networks were and how much they were impacted by the politics of what was going on. Yep. And it was kind of interesting too. I've looked at a few chemical analysis and they'd have like um, ultramarine and azurite in the same painting in the same area sometimes used um, together. And they're not quite sure if that was on purpose or maybe somebody was uh, altering their pigment before selling it and uh, combining it with lesser uh, quality pigments. Five minutes.
And I know I forgot to mention this in the uh, presentation, but ultramarine is kind of interesting. Uh, one monk had a um, monopoly on making it in, I believe it was Florence. Um, and uh, that was through the Medici family. He uh, started producing it and then became a monopoly uh, for the production. And he was using scraps of um, mineral that the uh, lapidary people were uh, leaving and making this into pigment. And uh, Chinini mentions that ultramarine was made by ladies because they had nice delicate hands for making it. Have you made ultramarine yourself? I have not yet. Uh, trying to get my hands on some good stuff before I go through the crushing and the uh, macerating and everything. Uh, info on health or death count for apprentices or workers. I really don't have that. Um, if anybody does, that would be awesome. Um, I got to think that uh, working with stuff like uh, arsenic and that kind of stuff uh, would not extend your life. Did that affect the who traded what rates of death or? Um, you would think it would have to um, a little bit at least uh, affect the price but I haven't found any uh, indications that that was a big factor. It may, it may also narrow down um, how many areas were willing to make it. And a fun little uh, bit on making mercury. There is a crazy recipe somewhere about uh, taking, taking an egg and putting in your mercury and then burying it in horse dung. And there's going to be a magical beast that's in there and it converts it into a uh, vermilion. And um, if this would work, I think it would be because of the sulfur in the egg may make it, but it was just kind of a crazy thing that I found in a period uh, recipe. <laughs> I'm I'm completely happy to switch off recording if if you think you're done. I think we're done. I think. Uh, okay.